thank you so much that we can be in this place with you. We thank you, Lord, for this day you've given to us. We rejoice in salvation. We rejoice in your presence. And we invite you into this place and into our hearts as we worship you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That was beautiful. All right, happy Sabbath, everyone. Today's offering is for our local conference advance, and the topic of money seems to have been important to Jesus. Two thirds of Jesus' parables are related to material possessions or one's attitude towards it. The Bible contains 2,000 references to money in the Bible, and just 500 references to prayer, and even fewer references to faith. Malachi 3, 10 through 12 is one of the most quoted passages on tithing. It is in fact where God's plan regarding tithes and offering is clearly stated. The whole nation had not set their hearts to honor God. They had been unfaithful, and God pled with them to return to him. God noticed their blemished offerings, the priest's unfaithfulness, and Judah robbing God. Robbing God seems to be too strong of a term for our culture today. It sounds manipulative, using guilt to induce Christians to give. But God owns the gold and silver. He has no need for our money. Rather, God wants the heart. He desires a covenant relationship of love that is demonstrated in our faithfulness. You were bought at a price by the blood of Jesus. Let nothing come between God and you. Your faithfulness is tied to your gratitude and is demonstrated by your cheerfulness in returning tithes and free will offerings to him. Your offerings today will be instrumental in bringing others to Christ through the outreach ministries of our local conference. Will the deacons please stand? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please flood our hearts and help us to remember that this is about you and about what we do for you and in your ministry and your grace. Help these offerings this Sabbath to go towards your ministry and whatever purpose you have in our lives. And help us to remember that. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. As the kids are going back to uh, their seats, we want to thank uh, all the parents uh, for bringing their children uh, to church and to Sabbath school 
uh, each Sabbath morning. It's a big task, I know, getting everybody ready and breakfasted and up and all that. So thank you very much to all the parents and the kids for coming this morning. Um, I did have uh, one uh, just quick announcement. I, in, the, in the lobby before I came into the church this morning, uh, one of the children's Sabbath school teachers came to me and said, Pastor Andy, please, 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 can you remind the parents to come and collect the children from Sabbath school on time? So um, sometimes I think uh, some, of the, some of the kids are still in the room like 10, 15 minutes after they should be collected. So please, I know it's, uh, it's a tough uh, line of work being a, a new parent, but please uh, pick up your children at the end of Sabbath school at uh, 10.40. Yes, we're still here, myself and my wife, uh, we're still here. Um, there's a little bit of confusion, I think, over um, our move to our transition to our new district. So yes, I was there uh, last weekend in my new district in Hutchinson, Kansas, um, but I'm go our family is gonna be transitioning out of Lincoln Piedmont Park to our new district over the next two or three months. So sometimes I'll be here and sometimes I won't. Okay, so uh, it, didn't, we, it didn't officially, it, I suppose it officially started last weekend, but there is a transition period here. So I hope you've uh, interpreted that and picked that up. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here this morning and thank you for all your giving. You'll see on the back of your bulletin, uh, the uh, Leap of Faith campaign. We are still uh, collecting pledges to retire the debt on our beautiful uh, new uh, building, uh, part of the building there. And uh, you can turn those pledges in uh, to uh, the pastors or the church office at any time. Um, we have a, a wonderful event going on this afternoon with a lot of uh, people signed up for this. We are going across the youth and the young adults and a couple of Sabbath school classes are going to a great uh, ministry here, based here in Lincoln. It's called Kids Against Hunger. How many of you have heard of that ministry, Kids Against Hunger? Yeah, many of you have. Okay, so there's a big group of us going this afternoon. Unfortunately, there's room for no more. We have uh, 40 people already signed up for that. So. Um, uh, you're, not able, you're not allowed to join us, even if you want to, in a nice way. Um, we also have uh, uh, a soup suppers again uh, next uh, Sabbath uh, in the evening. You'll see uh, behind me on the screen and also in the bulletin, I think on page six or seven, uh, come and join us for uh, singing, uh, food, and fellowship that uh, take pla takes place in the fellowship hall. Uh, next Sabbath. Boy, we'll be into March already, won't we? Next Sabbath, my goodness, uh, March 5. Okay, if you turn to uh, page 5, I think it is in your bulletin, um, we're going to take care of some of the transfers in and out uh, right now. Uh, one actually is on hold, but we're going to do the, let's do the outs first and then we'll do the in. Um, okay, so we need to take a vote on uh, these names. Uh, Joe and Katie Underhill are transferring their membership to Auburn Adventist Academy in Washington State. Um, do we have a, a motion uh, to accept their uh, transfer? We do, and a second. All those in favor, please show by lifting your arm. Uh, those against, and those too lazy to raise their arms. No, we won't go there. <laughs> Uh, and also, as you can see there, we have also um, a former student pastor with us uh, who is now uh, transferred into his own district with his family. So we have again the names of Ryan and Emily Watson to the Garden City Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, down in uh, Kansas. Do we have a, a motion there? We do. A second. Yep. Yeah. All those in favor? And any opposed? Okay, they are carried. Thank you very much. And we also have a second reading in for some transfers in. Are David and Mary Ellis here uh, this morning? Yes, please. Could you, are, you, are you available to come and join me up the front here? Are you comfortable with that? If you'd like to come up, that would be great. <laughs> Can uh, fight, fight your way through there. And uh, uh, David and Mary Ellis have been um, here for quite some time. I want to say months rather than weeks, I think. Is that right? Okay, and we've got the family coming up here as well. My goodness, all these big people coming up here against me. I'm going to take a few steps back. So it's, uh, it's uh, lovely to have... Oh, he wants to come up for no reason. Okay, well, there's got to be a reason, so please sit back down again. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> That's fine. Oh, my goodness, you've been doing some nice coloring, I see. So this is uh, David and Mary Ellis, and this is... David. Another David. Okay, and we have... Josh. Josh and... 
Ethan, okay, so on the paper here I've got David and Mary, so I'm guessing that's you two, but you guys are coming with them as well, so. Good, good, well thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, okay. <laughs> that, that's good, yes. There comes a time when the kids have to look after the parents, right? So that's good. <laughs> so can we have a motion to accept uh, this family, particularly David and Mary here in the middle, but also David and Josh, and uh, uh, the youngster here as well. Um, any, uh, I've got to ask for a motion, then a second. <laughs> and uh, all those in favor? And or any opposed? You know, when, it, when you come in unopposed, that's what they call unanimous. Right. Unanimous, so we're very happy to have you. Maybe we can have a short prayer for you before we segue into the next part of the service. Let's pray for you and your family. Thank you, Lord, for bringing these people into our congregation, into our midst. And we thank you for David and Mary and their family. For the kids and the grandkids, we pray that you will use them to bless us and that we may also reach out in friendship towards them as well as they uh, have uh, moved uh, to join us here at Piedmont Park Seventh-day Adventist Church. Bless them, bless their family. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming up the front as well. Welcome to the Piedmont Park Church family. Okay, well, thank you again for your uh, attention. Um, I think that's my part all done now, so I can go and sit down quietly. Thank you. I'll be reading uh, Acts 1, 6 through 9, uh, the New International Version. Acts 1, 6 through 9. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom in Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. Would you join us in singing songs of worship? Let's start with page 607, God of grace and God of glory. Please stand. Join us as we sing.
turn over to page 265. Breathe on me, breath of God, 265. We'll just sing the chorus as our prayer chorus as we finish. If you would please kneel for prayer. prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you this morning in awe, inspired by your word that's been shared with us, your word that's come to us through song and worship. Lord, we're inspired by your power and your glory. And as we come to the beauty that you've given us these days, we think and look forward to the spring, we realize that your life is constantly abundant. And Lord, it's abundant, not just as we look at your creation, but right in our hearts. And we thank you so much, Lord, for that blessing of your perpetual and, and, and forgiving, constantly forgiving love. Lord, we confess that we, we get busy. We get distracted from what you've called us to do. We thank you so much for your Sabbath that helps us to be reminded, for our heart to be pulled at, and your Holy Spirit to fill us up as it's just been talked about or we just sang about. Lord, we're thankful that you hear our prayers. Lord, we ask for, pray, for patience. We ask for your wisdom to have our hearts and our minds opened up to be guided, to be involved with you, to pay attention to 
what you're doing around us and what you're asking us to also participate in. Lord, we ask today for those who aren't able to be with us either for reasons of travel or for reasons of health or for other reasons, Lord, that they're not able to, that you would bind us together, that your Holy Spirit may weave a, a net that secures and keeps us comforted by your word and by, by your church that you live through. And Lord, we ask for your blessing today to fall upon Pastor Michael, that his words would be your words and that our hearts would be open to them, would guide us for today's understanding on this Sabbath and would take us through this week. We ask your spirit to go with us as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see each and every one of you here. I almost feel like it's wide open spaces as compared to last week when we had Union College here and the choir and the band, and this week it's just me. <laughs> Not just me, it's me and you and the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Good to have each and every one of you here on a beautiful, beautiful Sabbath morning. Well, I want to tell you, about a time when I sat in my car. I was sitting there, I was looking at the window at a building. The building I was looking at was not scary, but I'd never been there before. And I didn't know what was waiting for me inside. Now, maybe some people would have been scared to go inside, but not me. So I got out of my car. Without any problems, I got out and I walked into a Seventh-day Adventist church for the first time. And I was right. It wasn't scary. There were nice people inside. They were friendly. They were a little confused as to why I was there because I really didn't really blend into the crowd <laughs> that day when I walked in. But those folks in that tiny little church in Iowa. They loved that young man into the church. Yes. See, I already knew from studying the Bible, I already knew about God's love and forgiveness, but I needed to witness that love in these new people called Adventists. I already knew and believed the three angels' messages of Revelation. I'd studied that. But I needed to witness that that message made a difference in how people lived. Amen. And that tiny church was up to the task. Those folks loved me, and they witnessed to me, not dreaming that I would one day be a pastor <laughs> because I didn't look like I fit the bill that day. I didn't look like anything or anyone. They just did it because they were answering God's call in the Bible to witness. So many churches today, we, we specialize in bringing in programs and trying to help us find out what, what is God's plan for us? What are we supposed to do? And even Christians, I talk to them all the time and they say, I'm trying to search for God's will. I don't know what he wants me to do. I don't know where my spot in ministry is. And my friends, I believe if we take a wide view of the Bible this morning, we will see God's plan for our lives and for our church. So today I want you to put on the wide lens of your camera, of your eyes, and we're going to look into the Bible and try to find out God's plan, and we're going to try to see the scope of that plan this morning. So we're going to go to the beginning. If you've got Genesis in your Bible, that's a good place to start. So open up your Bibles to Genesis or click on your Bible if it's electronic and go to Genesis chapter 12. Join me there as we take a wide view of the Bible this morning. In Genesis chapter 12, we're going to look at verses 1 to 3 to begin. Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land 
that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is a huge moment in the story of Genesis, a huge moment in this book where God speaks to Abram, who eventually would be called Abraham. And God chooses, out of all the people living on the planet at that time, in Genesis, the first 11 chapters have all been kind of cosmic in scope, and now it gets really, really close and personal. And God befriends this one man. Why? Why does God call him out? Well, verse 3 tells us that God's plan in befriending this one guy, this one man, was so that God could bless who? The whole world. So in the first book of the Bible, we see God's plan is a worldwide plan. Now turn to the next book in the Bible, if you would, with me, to Exodus chapter 19. We're not going to hit all the books in the Bible, but we're going to look at a few of them. Exodus 19, I want you to see verse 6 with me. In the first scene, we see God speaking one-on-one -on -one with one man. Now God is speaking to an entire people. Exodus 19, verse 6. There on Mount Sinai, God's speaking to Moses, and he says, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. See, God tells Israel why he brought them out of Egypt. It wasn't just because they were special. In fact, they were kind of like everybody else. But he says, I'm fulfilling my promise to Abraham and I'm going to make you a nation of priests so that you can be an example to who? The whole world. God is focusing on witnessing to the whole world, even in the Old Testament. And sometimes we miss that point. We think the Old Testament is just about a certain people or a certain family. It's about the whole world. And then if we turn to the New Testament, Jesus' mission as the Messiah. When Jesus came, what was his mission for? Who was he trying to reach? Just Israel? No. Not at all. Not at all. Turn with me to Acts chapter 1 to our scripture reading for today. And let's see if Acts is very similar to the beginning in Genesis. Acts chapter 1. We'll start in verse 7. Acts chapter 1, verse 7 says, And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus tells his followers they're going to go where? To the ends of the earth of the earth. So where is that? H have you figured it out? Where is the end of the earth? The thing is round. How can you find the end of it? Have you found it yet? Or have you been like me? When you read verses like this in the Bible, did you think, well, that, that verse is all about missionaries. You know, that's, that's foreign missionaries going overseas. Well, it certainly includes that, friends. But now we're going to take off the wide lens of our camera. We're going to put on that zoom lens, and I want to zoom you right in to these verses. And let's stop and think what the end of the earth was for these disciples. Jesus says, you will witness in Jerusalem to begin with. He tells you, you're going to witness in Jerusalem. You, Jesus says, you're going to witness right here, right where you are. Right here is where you're going to witness. Right here where you call home you're going to need to witness. Witnessing is not just going overseas, amen? amen? Jesus continues, he says, you're going to witness in all Judea. Now, that sounds easy enough to me and you, right? Yeah, start with Jerusalem, then you do, do Judea, cross that off the list. But you got to remember the context right here. This is just a few weeks old from them seeing Jesus crucified. They knew about the realities of persecution. They knew about the opposition that they were going to face. So when he says, you're going to witness in all of Judea, do you think they, did their knees start knocking together? Did they maybe get a little nervous? So, oh, maybe not, because why? They got Jesus with them, right? 
we got the risen Savior. We got nothing to fear. We're going to go to Alderjea? No problem. Look out, Roman soldiers. You better get ready, Pharisees, because Jesus is coming, and we're coming with him, baby. They might not have been scared at all. But look at what they ask him in verse 6. We'll go back now to verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked Jesus, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They ask him, are, are you setting up the kingdom now? Is now the time? I don't know that Jesus ever did a face palm. But if there ever was a time when Jesus would have just been like, I know I would have been like, oh, after three years, after the resurrection, and you still don't get it? What does that question imply? They are assuming Jesus is staying with us. You're going to set up the kingdom now. He's, he's not going anywhere. He's going to set up the kingdom, and yeah, we're going to go everywhere. Well, friends, the kingdom was coming, just not in the way they were thinking. The kingdom of Christ and his grace was going to come through their witnessing, through what they would do in witnessing, not through Jesus throwing down earthly rulers, but through the Holy Spirit working through believers. The kingdom would come, Jesus says in verse 8, through our witnessing. You're going to witness in all Judea. And I bet they thought, wow. What are people going to say when we tell them about Jesus coming back from the dead? Oh, I can't wait to tell somebody. But I don't think they were real nervous about that because they could have thought, we got the evidence right here. we we'll just bring Jesus in, have a, have a look. And they didn't realize in just a mere moments, Jesus was going to go up and be gone. And that their witnessing would just be through telling the story without any hard core evidence. So let's review. Jesus says you're going to witness in Jerusalem. You're going to witness close to home. And then he says you're going to witness in Judea, even amongst opposition, among your countrymen. And he says the Holy Spirit is going to help you to witness. Does God want to give us the power to witness? Amen. Does he still today want to give us the Holy Spirit to witness to others? Yes. Then many times I ask myself, what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? The first time I got out of my car to go into an Adventist church, I wasn't scared. I wasn't nervous. It wasn't hard at all. But there was a time. There was a different time when I had a hard time getting out of my car. It was when I was the student pastor here at Piedmont. <laughs> I was young. I was brand new. I was working with Pastor Myers, and he had given me a whole bunch of contact info. And he said, I want you to go to these folks. They've ordered books from Amazing Facts, or it is written, so we've got some contact info from them. I want you to go see if you can start some Bible studies. I said, okay. Took all the cards, and I drove to the first card's address, to the first person. And then I sat there in my car, looking at the door. <laughs> and I just kept looking at the door. I thought, I, I can't get out of my car. I thought, what is going on? It's almost like I was talking to myself. What, what is, what's wrong with me? And then I figured I better start maybe talking to my body parts. And I said, listen here, feet. We are getting out of this car, and we are going up to that door. And my feet responded. Not literally, but it was like they said, well, you better have a conversation with your hands because they got to open the door and it looks like they got other ideas. And I looked at my hand and my hand was reaching up to the car keys to start the car again. I said, hand, what are you doing? And my head said, who, me? What do you mean? I said, what do you mean, what do I mean? You're starting the car. He said, well, I, I, I thought we'd come back later. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, it's daytime, after all, and would, would they even be home? And then other body parts started talking, too. Yeah, that's right, you know, we, we should come back later. Let's leave and come back some other time. I said, no, 
We are here now. We need to go up and knock on that door. Let's go. And I could not get out of that car. I said, this is ridiculous. I am Michael Halfhill. I do not get nervous. I used to talk on the radio all the time. My hand said we didn't have to knock on doors when we were in radio. <laughs> and, and the other body part started to agree. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's right. And the rebellion was growing in my body. Finally, I said, that's enough. Pastor Myers has asked me to make contact with these folks. We are getting out of this car. All of us, body, are going to work together, and we're getting out, we're going over there, and we're knocking on that door. So finally, my body relented, still grumbling a bit on the way, dragging the feet a little bit. But I got out of the car. I walked up to the door, and I knocked. And someone was home. And my whole body wanted to say, ah, we were betting on them not being here. They opened the door just a crack, just a little bit. A face peered out. And so I gave them my pitch, told them who I was connected to, and, and asked if they would be interested in studying the Bible and doing Bible studies. And the man inside replied, thank you, no, boom, the door shut. I know some of you were expecting this would all end in a baptism, weren't you? <laughs> no. So I walked back to the car, my first experience ever, knocking on a door to witness. And you know what happened? It was like my feet said, that wasn't so bad. And my hand said, sure, if that's the worst that can happen, we can do this. So I kept knocking. And I did get some Bible studies started. But why am I telling you this story? I'm telling you this because witnessing can appear scary. I know it full well. And not everyone has it in them to go knocking on doors. I barely did. But there are other ways to witness, amen? We can witness in song. We can witness in prayer. We can witness in the life we live. But that's why we started the Thunder Ministry here at Piedmont, to give you the tools so that you could begin sharing with your friends, your neighbors. And, and it's not like you have to take them door to door. We're not saying that. But friends, I believe if we pray and if we ask God to reveal to us who is ready to hear about him, God will answer, won't he? And I want you to hear an exciting story this morning. I want to invite Betty and, and Leon to come up and join me here. And I want to just kind of interview them a little bit. Most of you guys know Betty, she is our head deaconess, and, and Leon is, our, is one of our elders. And I just want to ask them a few questions and, and let you guys tell them what exciting things have been happening here recently. Now, you guys originally ordered one of the Thunder sets, is that right? Yes, we did. Well, you better give him the microphone yeah, so everybody can. Uh, oh, you got one too? Okay. Yeah. okay. All right, let's get, let's get you on there. So, so you ordered a Thunder set? Yes, we did. Okay. We set. And what was your plan when you first got that first DVD set? Uh, we had had a uh, study group at our home, and our plan was to redo the study group and invite friends uh, that were not Adventists to come into the study group. Okay, so you were going to DVDs. You were going to do a group, and that was your plan. That was our plan. Did God have a different plan, Betty? Yes, He did. Okay, what, what was what was God's plan? Well, um, His sister came to visit us at Christmas. Mm -hmm. She was having some family problems that made her uh, kind of sad, I guess okay. you would say. So she came and he had the plan that he would like to show this series to her, but we hadn't seen it either. And so we wanted to um, watch it all together, right. all of us together. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. Okay. So tell us about that experience. What was it like watching Thunder with her? Um, it, it was really interesting because uh, it was in a format that was easy to do. Mm -hmm. We just put it in a DVD player, and it was an interview format, mm -hmm. and it was really interesting that the interviewer was Pastor Michael. That's right. Now, how did she feel when she was done watching this and you were able to tell her that the guy on the DVD was actually a local pastor? Uh, she? she really identified with the idea that you were um, the interviewer and that you were also our pastor, 
And I think the one thing that, that was most impressive to her is prophecy was the thing that opened the door for you. Mm -hmm. And as she was watching uh, the DVDs, it presented prophecy in a way that she had never in her life seen before. Amen. And the prophecy helped to open that door. And then to be on site, uh, to show these site pictures, the one that, that was most impressive to her, I, I hate to steal the thunder of, oh, <laughs> of, the, of the DVDs, but it showed Gomorrah. And it, it showed the site narrator pick up a handful of the, quote, sand, and it was like ash. It was like ash. It was just blow away. There was nothing, no substance to it. And that was a very uh, impressive moment for her. Okay, and you guys finished the studies with her. What, what was the results? Yeah, we, we did like sometimes three of those in one evening. We just looked forward to it. It was so much fun. Mm -hmm. so. And, and once she finally finished, what well, happened? Um, there are a couple times that were pretty hard. Uh, one Wednesday night, uh, we did a lesson on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And she kind of understood the Sabbath, but this time she really understood the significance of the Sabbath. And she broke down weeping. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh man, I've blown it. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, what do I do now? because it's caused such stress in her life. What do I do? So that night I went to bed and I'm praying, what do we do? And we decided, well, we're just gonna continue because if we break the sequence now, it might give the impression that well, there's something wrong with it. So I just had to continue. And then um, the following Friday night, uh, she says to me, <laughs> it's hard. I never thought I'd see myself as a Seventh-day Adventist. Amen. I never thought so. And I had to say, I never thought I'd see you. I did as a Seventh-day Adventist. Yeah. And I thought, man, we got to get the pastor over here mm -hmm. uh, because our time is running out. I'm supposed to be taking her back to uh, Kansas, and we've got some lessons to go, and we need some advice. So I said, how would you feel about this guy that's we've been watching and she had come and seen in the church coming over to the house to have a chat with us and she said yes i'd really like to see him and um we've made it right that's right we got a baptism date planned for i think sometime in june in Is june thinking? uh she's having a birthday and she's somewhat intimidated by her birthday on june 9 because she's turning 75. And I thought, you know, let's bring the two of them together, have a baptism on close to her birthday. She's, so she's born again Amen. on this intimidating 75th birthday. Amen. Amen. You n never would have guessed, would you? Never, never, never. never. So what's your plan for the future with Thunder now? Because I think you, the tape, the set you have is, is gone, right? We gave it yeah, to I you. don't gave have it away. my Thunder set anymore. <laughs> it's in Kansas because I sent it with her. Mm -hmm. So I need to pick up another set that you have for me. We've got it. Because I ordered another set, and I'm hoping that that set's going to go someplace, and I'm giving that away eventually too. Amen. Because we want to start another uh, series. Because I'm trying to open up the door. I've mentioned that to some people that my pastor is the narrator of this interesting series that takes place in the Holy Land. So... Uh, I'm trying to open up that door and get somebody else to interest it also. Amen. Yes, he has somebody that uh, that he kind of keeps in contact with that did some remodeling in our house. Mm -hmm. And we, we're hoping maybe, we keep praying mm -hmm. about it, we could get him. He's that's looking wonderful. for a church. That's wonderful. And that's what this is all about, is just yeah. giving you tools to make witnessing fun yeah. and easier and not so scary. All right, well, thank you so much for what you have done. We are thrilled, and I can't wait for June to get here. That will be a very, very special day. And what's, what's really awesome is where Leon's sister is living is actually in the district where Pastor Ryan is. He's already met her and made connection there as well. Uh, so we're just thrilled by that. Friends, it's God's plan that all of us witness in the way that God has gifted us. It's not all the same. Not one program works for everybody. 
but God has called you, and there are people in your life who will listen to you who will never come up and talk to me. I'm too scary looking. And there are people who, if they were to park out here, they would look at this building and say, "Uh uh-uh, I just just can't go in there. The people in there are probably scary. But there are people who know you. And if they make connection with you, they won't have a problem coming in here. And they won't have a problem coming to me, as intimidating as I can be. God has gifted you. Jesus said, back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, He says, you're going to witness not just in Jerusalem, not just in Judea, but he says, you're going to witness in Samaria. And we kind of just read over that just fine. Yeah, no, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, they all kind of rhyme. No, 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 when they heard that, I think they thought, whoa, hold the phone. Samaria? Did the Jewish folks have strong ties to Samaria? No, when you go, they had strong ties in the sense that they were connected from years ago, but they weren't bosom buddies. They didn't get along great. In fact, if you go to John chapter 4, verse 9, Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman, and he asks her for a drink, and she says, wait a second. How can you, a Jewish guy, talk to me? We don't talk to each other. So you mean Jesus, we're supposed to witness in Samaria? Is Jesus telling us we're supposed to witness to people who aren't even like us? Yeah. Yeah. You mean we're supposed to witness to people that we think might not even be interested in hearing? It's interesting that Jesus included Samaria. He was expanding their view of mission. It's not just your homeland. It's not just your people. But it's anyone that I bring into your path to cross with you. Jesus wants us to witness to anyone, amen? Amen. Even those who aren't like us. Finally, Jesus said, you will be my witnesses to the, what's it say there in Acts chapter 1, verse 8? To the end of the earth. What's the end of the earth to the disciples? Is it, I mean, they're, they're all the way over here. What's the end of the earth? Is it Turkey? Is it, is it Greece? Is it Spain? Is it Africa? Well, friends, when Jesus says, I want you to witness to the end of the earth, and he says that while standing in the Middle East, I think he means this message is going to be witnessed all the way across the sea, all the way to North America. Amen? When he says it's going to go to the ends of the earth, he says it's going to go across the sea. It's going to go to North America, and it's even going to go to the great plains of North America. Would you say amen to that too? And I think when Jesus says, you're going to witness and this message is going to go to the ends of the earth, I think Jesus at that moment in time is thinking it's going to go across the sea to North America. It's going to go to the Great Plains. It's going to go even to Lincoln, Nebraska. Where is the end of the earth for the disciples? Friends, you want to know what the end of the earth might be today? I took a picture of what I think might be the end of the earth today. I'm going to show it to you. You ready to see it? There it is. That's the house across my street. And for me, that might be the end of the earth. And that might be where I'm called to go. Yes, the end of the earth involves going to Peru. Yes, the ends of the earth involves building churches in Honduras. But please catch this thought. The ends of the earth also includes Lincoln, Nebraska. It includes our neighborhoods. It includes our schools. And as we learn today here with Leon and Betty, the end of the earth can be as close as our family. Witnessing, it can happen in so many ways. It's not just using thunder. It's not just knocking on doors. It's not just sending out tracks. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9 says, Now he who plants and the one who waters are, are one and each one will receive of his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. Did you catch that? You're a fellow worker with God, and you're God's field, and you're God's building. We all have a part to play in witnessing, amen? Amen. But is Jesus' message today, is it still one about witnessing everywhere? I mean, we're talking about just Acts 1. You say, maybe that was just for the disciples. Well, then you go all the way to the end. Now we're back to our mega focus lens. We started in Genesis, we're ending in Revelation, Revelation 14, verse 6, and it says that this angel has an eternal gospel 
To do what with it? To preach to those who live on the earth, to every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and every people. Jesus still wants us to go to the end. You will be my witnesses to everywhere and to everyone when the Spirit comes upon you. My friends, is the Holy Spirit still working? Is he still in the business of helping believers to witness today? Well, if the answer is yes, and that's true, has the Spirit lost any power? Is he weaker today than he was back in Acts? No. Then why so many times do I find myself or do we find ourselves sitting in the car of our lives arguing with our hands and our feet about witnessing to somebody? Why do we do that? I encourage you, my friend, get involved in a ministry that works for you and then pray and ask the Holy Spirit how he's gifted you for witnessing because your gift for witnessing might be different than mine. They might not look the same. And then ask God for opportunities to share your faith. He will answer that prayer. And if you're concerned and say, but pastor, I don't know what to say. I don't even know what I would tell somebody or how I would do it. Just remember what Jesus told them. You will be witnesses of me. That's what we do. We witness about Jesus. We tell others what he has done in our lives. And who do we tell? Acts 1 verse 8 says, we tell those who are close to us in our homeland. We tell those who may even be opposed. We tell those who aren't even like us. We tell the world. And the message to tell, it's two simple words. Jesus saves. That's the message. We boil it down. Jesus saves. You don't need a doctorate in order to tell him that. Amen? Jesus saves. That's the message. He saved me. He can save you. The world is waiting to hear. Jesus saves. Let's tell them all, and let's tell them all the way until the end. Almighty Father in heaven, I thank you and praise you so much that at one point in time, someone decided to tell a rock and roll DJ that Jesus saves. And it started with a video of a person I had never even met. But then it came down to people in a church who, in my view, got up way too early on a Saturday morning. But they told me that Jesus saves. Now, Lord, there are more people out there who need to hear. And we know your power hasn't diminished. We know your Holy Spirit is still desperate to work. So help us, Lord, to stop arguing with our hands, to stop arguing with our feet. Give us the courage to get out of the car, wherever it may be, and to tell someone else, Jesus saves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Will you stand and sing with us our closing song of dedication, Jesus Saves. Page 340, if you want to follow in your hymn or the words are on the screen. We have heard a joyful song, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, spread the gladness all
I can remember walking along the campus there at Union College, humming a song. And I used to hum all the time when I was at Iowa State, but I didn't hum hymns when I was at Iowa State. And this time I was walking along Union College and I was humming, da 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 Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And I kept singing that and I thought, you know what, I should really, I should learn the rest of those lyrics. <laughs> and then God said, even if you don't ever learn the rest of the lyrics, you got enough. Yeah. Jesus saves. Almighty Father in heaven, Lord, maybe there is someone here today who's never realized just how much Jesus loves them, who's never realized that his death was for them to save them from the hurt, the pain, the anger of this world, to save them from the chains of sin. Lord, if right now someone's realizing that, may they reach out to you and claim that wonderful promise, Jesus saves. And Lord, if there's someone here today who's feeling discouraged, who's feeling like I need to get involved and I need to tell someone else, Lord, I pray that you'll inspire all of us to answer that call. It's the call you gave to Abraham, to Israel, to the disciples, even to those sitting and standing in Lincoln. It's the call to witness to someone else that Jesus is still in the business of saving. So Lord, help us to witness across the lands and the far seas, but to witness across the street in the neighborhoods and homes. Help us to tell the song of victory, Jesus saves. And all those willing to tell the wonderful story said, Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful Sabbath.